Welcome to Massive Passive Cash Flow, the podcast that guides professionals to financial prosperity. Join our community and let's start building your wealth. Here's your host, Gary Wilson. Welcome back to the Massive Passive Cash Flow Podcast. I'm Gary Wilson, your host, and I'm glad to see you back. If you haven't done so, if you don't mind, would you please subscribe to the podcast? It's on 30 different channels, including Apple, the biggie, but you know, choose the one that you like. And while you're out there, please visit globalinvestoragent.com. These are the real estate agents that we train to work with you and I, the investor. Remember, these are not typical agents. I mean, they can help you buy your own home, but they really shine when it comes to investing. They have the tools and strategies to identify, analyze, and negotiate on and off market deals, which are good for us. And if you are an agent listening, <laughs> You, you see what's going on in the economy. I mean, now's a good time to prepare. And if you'd like, go ahead and uh, on that site, you can uh, fill in uh, your name and email and um, have a conversation. Let's see if this is the kind of thing that might uh, help you not just survive and thrive yourself. And by the way, what better way to learn how to invest than working with other investors, right? So in any case, uh, we got a great guest today, Franco Perez from San Jose, California, a beautiful part of the country. Always pleasant weather. Great people and beautiful bay and mountains close by, beach close by, and <laughs> lots of happy entrepreneurs. It's Entrepreneur Central, man. So, so Franco, hey, first of all, thank you for joining us. I know, I know you're a busy guy, and I really appreciate you taking your time to help. Oh, of course. Thanks for having me. It's it's a pleasure to be on here. Yep. Yeah. Well, I know we're just talking. One of these days, I'll get back out there and uh, maybe we'll cruise down to Santa Cruz and there's a famous statue there of. Uh, can't remember the Hawaiian dude's name. It's a famous surfer. He came to visit the States in the early 1900s. Um, uh, oh, yeah. Prince Kamehameha, something like that, but a great surfing spot. And uh, uh, UC Santa Cruz has a marine biology site there, which is pretty awesome. See, everybody deserves to go see that. But, but in any case, if you will mind, uh, give us a little background, kind of paint a picture of, you know, you know kind of how you got to where you are, what led to, the, what led to your current business model. And then we can jump into some, um, maybe some examples, do some some how to, and and help educate everybody. You know. Yeah. So sure. Uh, long story short, I kind of moved here from the Philippines at a young age, and uh, grew up um, with a weird situation where my family, my parents split up at, at around 17, 18 years old, and I grew up with just my single mom and um and my younger sister and i say that because i had at this at around 18 i had to drop out of school i had to work full time just to support my mom to be able to afford rent at the end of every single month and i remember the pain and the struggle of paying rent at, at the end of every month borrowing money from even my boss at the time just to make ends meet and it was one of the hardest times of my life and from there i become a, i became a real estate agent started doing that for a while I ended up disliking it a lot because I had to turn away a lot of people saying, hey, you don't make enough saying, hey, you don't have enough as a down payment, but come back to me when you do. And, and the truth of it is, it's very difficult for them to ever come back, to ever feel like the dream of home ownership is ever possible. So mm -hmm. I really kind of left that agent space and tried to find something that would help people that were in the shoes that I was in to be able to help relieve that pain for a lot of these really good, hardworking people that don't have opportunity for home ownership. And I came across mobile homes and come to find out they aren't what you think. Come to find out they're spread out throughout the country in many metro areas and very expensive areas. So I helped a lot of people get out of this rent cycle into home ownership, uh, into starting ownership in a mobile home, in a mobile home park. And then from there into... Um, from there into getting into real estate. And so we we grew a business that way. And then we also now are converting a lot of people's old mobile home, trailer-like homes, building these massive 1,800 square foot, three bedroom, two bath mobile homes in these communities. Mm -hmm. And that's become a huge thing for us lately. Yeah. Well, that sounds pretty awesome. I, I, what I like is you're, you're actually helping to solve a problem there's a great need in our country right now for housing in general and more specifically for affordable housing and you know, it, you know for a long long time we've had mobile homes and mobile home parks and 
lots of people listening, maybe some of them may even own some of those parks and, and have made money by being the landowner and then leasing out the individual uh, rentable spaces. But, and then the owner brings in their, their home, their mobile home. And a few do own the mobile homes too. But what's interesting is nowadays, if you look at them, you can clearly see they're not the mobile homes of, of 50 years ago. You know, and I'm sure there's a lot changed in the in production uh, methodology. And uh, so maybe, maybe can would you are you able to touch on that a little bit about like the mobile homes of today? I'm pretty sure they're not like what we used to see as, as kids on 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 television and drive you know drive my old neighborhoods, right? <laughs> Absolutely, and that's the thing is that our most people's only perception of mobile homes are through the movies or through mm -hmm. these uh you know these videos of uh these parks being the most poverty like locations the bad quality home stigmas it's really the stigmas that we face right because that's all the context that we really have now if you think about it nowadays the construction of these homes are so much more advanced and the quality of these homes are so much better as well i, I want to mention since we're talking about the construction is that we're actually facing a huge construction issue. Part of our, a huge part of our affordable housing issue is that the cost to construct these homes are getting higher and higher because labor is more yeah. expensive and materials more expensive. And guess what? All of our, most of our labor are older generation people that are getting into retirement and we're not having younger generation people that want to get into the world of construction. So that problem is only going to get worse and worse. Uh, that being said, I also want to bring this an other analogy is that when ca that cars were really only built and affordable for the rich and wealthy before, and it was only until we started building these on an assembly line that we were able to build this at scale at a much lower cost so that everybody could afford it. And that's the same concept that we have to realize real estate and home construction and how can we use that same element and make cost affordable for everyone. And if you look at our factories, if you see our YouTube channel and how we build these homes nowadays, we're actually building these on assembly lines at a very rapid rate, at a very effective rate, using the least amount of labor and also using the least amount of materials and saving the environment at the same time. So the, the level of quality and the level of standards that we go by, we go by national HUD code, which is a very high standard already. Yeah. And we build these at very high quality, two, two by four exteriors, you got fiber cement exteriors as well. And the foundation of these are, are so much more advanced than people know. Yeah. Well, I didn't realize they had gone to two by four construction for the exterior walls. I mean, again, that uh, last time I was in one, it was a kid. I was, like, I was a kid. And unfortunately, the family that lived there, they had actually had a hole in the floor, you know. And um, but the, the interesting thing is the mobile home park they're in, they had a pool. And I thought, well, that's cool, you know. Yeah. I, mean, yeah. I just that was again, that was my view of them since I was a kid, but then I've, I've noticed lately, like I've, I started, I moved to Florida in 2016, there are some really nice mobile home parks there. People putting gardens out in front and just patios and decks and all kinds of neat stuff. There's trails, you know, it's, it's completely different, you know? Um, so the, the, the units themselves, like in Florida, we have hurricanes, you know? Um, in California, there's, you know, the Cape, people always, I think people up back east think California is always on fire. That's not true. <laughs> uh -huh. There's always the season. You always know Californians all know there's a lot of rain in the winter time and everything looks pretty and green. They call it fuel for the fires that pop up in the late summer, early fall. And you get, you get used. It's not pleasant, but you kind of you get used to it. And it's not the entire state. It's usually pockets, and you get a you get an earthquake maybe once or twice a century. So, but you have to build for the. You have to be, have codes to account for those, those environmental things and the weather things like, like anywhere, like hurricanes in Florida, tornadoes in Alabama. Um, but as far as the affordability, what, you know, what can someone expect if someone's listening and they're thinking, you know, maybe I'll have uh, my son and daughter, they just got married. They want a home, but you know what? We just can't help them buy a half million dollar house right now. But maybe we can help them with a mobile home. What's what's the difference? Would you say an average? I mean, what would be the difference in cost and average, um, or what is the average cost? I guess I should say, even just for yeah. The so so I could speak on a national level. It's very 
it's it's a wide contrast, right? So, but if we were talking about San Jose Silicon Valley, it's probably the the highest numbers of these. But I want the listeners to understand that these ratios still kind of are equivalent in other metro areas. So, in our area, two bedroom apartment for rent is typically about thirty five hundred dollars a month, and then to purchase an average okay looking single family home is 1.6 million dollars right and it's a huge gap in between and it's very difficult for someone to be able to go from renting into um real estate ownership now our mobile homes in our area in san jose they average about three hundred fifty thousand dollars uh, and what what why that's important is that one if you're trying to purchase a single family home most people feel it's unattainable but yeah. You know, instead of having to put a six digit down payment, you can instead purchase one of these just to get out of that rent cycle and start your homeowning journey. So you have a 10% down payment and your average mortgage is going to be about $2,800. And then your space rents about $1,100. So in return, in total, your payment is about $3,900, but it's mm-hmm. just a little bit more than the rent. But you get a lot of the benefits of the home ownership. You have appreciation, which a lot of people think don't happen. But you have you you get to benefit from the loans and the mortgage that you have, and then you also get a lot of tax benefits as well. So mm-hmm. with with a lot of home ownership, what we what we really realize is that because home why home ownership is so important to becoming wealthy unfortunately, only the rich and wealthy are able to benefit from these four benefits, right? And we have to work on creating it more attainable for everybody. And that's where mobile homes come in and these false stigmas about it, really. And, um, you know, I, I I push to expose the real benefits of these. Oh, yeah. Well, so, so one of the key differences is for everybody is that typically the mobile homeowner doesn't own the land or they're, they're renting the space in a mobile home park. I mean, there obviously there's exceptions. There's I know there's, um, you know, farmers that will buy mobile homes to house their farm workers, their seasonal farm workers. And the farmer, farm workers are happy because they live right there. They don't have to commute anywhere. They live out in nature. They got trees and fields and, and animal. <laughs> and I mean, range, you know, that's a very, a lot more affordable for the farmer to buy those and put them in than they go build, you know, a bunch of duplexes or something, you know? Um, so there's all kinds of uses, but, but let's talk about the um, uh, so the investors now. I, I know we've we're getting up. I, I know this is going to be a great subject when it came up. I'm so so glad that you're able to willing to do this. Um, there, it's been a hot topic in the last probably generation, more so in the last as the, as time has gone on, it's become more critical in the last ten years and way more. I mean, in the last since the pandemic, we're having weekly conversations now with investors. And they're like. I need to buy some land that I can put a mobile home park. At. I need to, I, I want to buy this old RV park, convert it to a mobile home park. Can you help me with that? Um, what would you say is one of the benefits to to investors who can provide, you know, places for the mobile home owners to to put their homes? You know, I mean, is it they make it more yeah. rich than they were ten years ago, or you know? Yeah. So from the investors element, uh, it's really the park ownership, right? So the first thing is to understand what mobile home parks are. They are very misunderstood and and don't write them off as some as some something that you should ignore, right? I think that's the first out the first phase of it. And then come to realize, you know, because part of what we do is we help people analyze what the value of this uh, mobile home park is, and then how can we value add this to be worth more as well in the future. Right. So investors are looking a lot, uh, looking for a lot of different asset types. Mobile home parks is a big one. And there's a huge reason why so much attention is going towards it. You see hedge funds getting into it and that sort of thing. Warren Buffett's a big, uh, investor in this, in this sector as well. Right. And, yeah. and we have to, as an investor, understand why. Right. One is, like you mentioned, affordable housing is such a big issue. The, um, and only until recently, for a while, nobody's ever building these parks because uh, it's misunderstood, but all of a sudden there's parks being built. So where are these use cases uh, very valuable? You know, we have a lot of fast growing cities where a big, you know, Tesla builds a, a big plant that has a ton of jobs. And we have, you know, for example, I have a guy that I'm working with, they bought a plot of land and they want to turn it into a mobile home park because that's the fastest way for them to build affordable housing in that area, 
right? Yeah. Um, these, these, the way that we build these homes in factories are the fastest and most efficient and most eco-friendly ways to build these homes. And mm-hmm. if we can tie that along with the land itself, it becomes a very great use case. So as an investor, you can find land and find opportunities to where you can prop up a bunch of these homes quickly without having to deal with hiring a huge general contractor to develop a ton of housing. Um, But that's kind of what we're seeing. I could get really deep into the details, but uh, generally we're seeing a lot of investors get into that. Yeah. But the the investors, the landowners, are they paying like, uh, I guess we're paying the property tax on the land and, and probably some insurance on the land and property taxes but what about water is water does the landowner pay the water bill or does that get passed on to the tenant who's bringing in the mobile home to live in it i mean is there it could vary i'm guessing it could be it it, it does vary yeah unfortunately there's no universal rule to it some communities charge their tenants for their utilities separately some some offer it to their tenants as well so um yeah yeah, th- th- that is something definitely to consider is what, how does it, what, what are the utilities at that lot? Um, and, and it could be a big problem if you are an investor, make sure to keep an eye out for that. But like you said, mentioned about the pool, you know, understand that these, the amenity element of it is really beneficial. The lifestyle that you're providing for these people that own these homes on these properties are a big deal too. Having a swimming pool, we're seeing gyms, billiard rooms, we have yeah. dog parks communities and they end up being very beautiful communities and the more we can do that the the value add we can bring to it as well right and and that's something that's uh being done in these communities also yeah i know i've seen that lately too it's pretty awesome tennis courts you know it's great there's one that was at um uh near ocean city maryland area called assateague and there was a golf course right there and and they're right around the golf carts through the neighborhoods and the pool they can go fishing and the there's um it's brackish water it's an you know, ocean water mixed in with the water coming from the river and you know it's just an awesome place you know so in any case um now the the um the rental like for san jose you're i think you mentioned the average rental they might be paying 1100 a month to, to place their mobile home is that is that is that right or is that closer okay correct so, correct so for every investor out there just imagine this you can own the land, and of course, the more amenities you offer, the more you can charge. But you're getting eleven hundred a month, and but you don't have to worry about the home and all the like the maintenance and repairs and the roofing and all the Absolutely. stuff that you got to maintain a home. The person your tenant brings the home, and they're responsible for that. You're just simply, literally, renting the lease leasing the land out, and I'm pretty yeah. sure they're going to pay you because their home's on your land. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking this is probably why so many people or investors are looking at mobile home parks because it's affordable. People can afford it. There's a great demand, great need for it. I mean, we need housing. We're three to four million units short right now in the country, housing units short. And instead of going through all the pain and expense of building new or buying old homes and fixing them up and renting them back out, we have all the maintenance to repair over he- um, um, headaches. It, you don't have that here. I mean, it's to, to me, it's like, you know, it's the ideal situation. And probably, it, I don't know this, but I'm wondering if the, um, when you lease mobile home park space, is that fall, is that, would that ever fall subject to rent controls? I would think not because rent control typically applies to the rented unit. We'll be right back with the Massive Passive Cash Flow podcast after I invite you to Monday Night Live. Every Monday night, 7 p.m. Eastern, I teach a class without fail for you on subjects ranging from flipping to buying rentals, managing rentals, wholesaling, commercial, creative purchasing techniques, analyzing properties, identifying properties, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of subjects. And if you are a licensee, if you have a real estate license, you should definitely tap in because there are a lot of investor agents also in the class. Many of them are on the, on the uh, global investor agent team. So you can learn from them as well as from me how to actually work with investors correctly and profitably. All right, we'll see you Monday night. The link is in the show notes. Go ahead and register. We'll get right to the the Massive Passive Cashflow Podcast.
I'm guessing. Have you, have you ever heard of that in mobile home parks? Yeah, that- I'm, I'm very familiar with it. And that's going to be dependent on the municipality and the cities. Mm-hmm. In San Jose, there is rent control for these lots. And, and in other, ci- like, other cities, there aren't, right? So that is going to depend on that city. But every city has its own different... I, I do a lot of uh, stuff with the government as well. But every city has a different priority. Right. Um, but with that, you, you touch on a lot of key points there is that on the, you know, it's really a win win for, for society and for these park owners as well. Right. You're creating affordable housing and you're creating ownership opportunities, not just affordable housing, but you're, you're allowing ownership. And the key to that is it's a hybrid ownership. So you kind of share ownership of these lots as a park owner. You have less defaults. Like you said, you don't have to deal with a messy, to- a broken toilet, broken roofs, that sort of thing, because these tenants that are renting your lot actually own a huge, uh, they own the home above. So they have pride of ownership of it. So they take care of it. You have, you know, these people that are taking care of their home because they have pride of owning it. And then you have way less defaults and way less late payments and that sort of thing as well, because it's a shared risk. It's a shared investment by the both of you. And by that, by that relationship with both of you, you both want to take care of your property. You both want to make the payments on time. You both have an incentive to not default, right? And so right. In, in return, it becomes less problematic, easier to maintain as a park owner. And it, it becomes a win-win for, for all parties. Yeah. Well, I want to do this. I want to go back to the actual mobile home itself. We talked about the construction techniques for definitely better. You know, I mean, 1,800 square foot homes now, three bedrooms. That's just crazy because in the old days, there was nothing close to that, you know. But what about yeah. the inside of the units themselves, the amenities, the bathrooms, the kitchen, the, the flooring and the windows? Tell us a little bit about that, you know. Yeah. So, so basically the construction, you know, our new standard is we we have to be eco friendly. We have dual pane windows, we have drywall inside. The homes that we're building, we our company, we really push the limits of what's possible. So we have twelve foot high flat ceilings, which is incredible, and we also have like waterfall quartz islands, stainless steel appliances. Keep in mind these are eighteen hundred square foot homes, three bedrooms, two baths. We have standalone bathtubs. Uh, if you're listening, you should definitely check out the you know the visuals. We have 3D tours. We have photos and videos on our YouTube channel. Um, but really, take a second to see the quality of how these homes actually look, uh, because you'll be shocked. You know these homes. In many cases in our area, like these people that are buying $1.6 million homes that are actually old and have broken issues with plumbing and that sort of thing, oh, and yeah. they. And then they compare it to our homes that are brand new, have, you know, everything has a warranty and they can feel comfortable and, and knowing that everything's brand new. It's, it's just so, um, it's so interesting to compare the two. You know, we have people that are selling their single family home that go to these homes, to the mobile homes because it's less to maintain. It's more affordable. It's less property taxes that they're paying and it becomes something more, um, more manageable and easier for their life oh my gosh well i'm thinking of people getting out of college and even trying to start families or in their 20s and 30s and like like millennials for example i mean is there is there um um when it comes to demographics would that be one of the larger groups of people who are getting into use to, to um owning mobile homes versus buying the the old brick and mortar is it the millennials i mean kind of tell me about the the, the demographics as far as who's using them you know yeah, I mean, generally on average for a long time, it's always been the older, um, about 45 and older that are into these communities. Uh, but only until recently that we're starting to build these with a lot nicer technology and a lot of nicer uh, quality of build that we're starting to see a lot of millennials. And and we're going to definitely see that more and more later down the line because um, they're, they're becoming a huge part of our purchasing um of of real estate purchasing but generally we have a mix of coming from both ends we have people that own real estate that have their kids moving out they want something less to maintain and they want something easier to manage where they can retire in right and they're downsizing from there and then we have people that are coming from their first career and want to get into home ownership and realize that real estate is too unattainable for them and they're Mm -hmm. stepping up 
right? And and upgrading from renting into their first level of home ownership. So we really have a mix of both worlds going into this as a middle point, right? right. But the mo- social mobility is really what I love about mobile home parks is because it allows people to step out of where they want to be and have a hybrid style mo- uh, model, right? And with that, it's 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 it really eases a lot of people's lives. Oh my gosh! Well, I'm thinking, you know, back to the the millennials. You know, there a lot of them have been choosing to rent. California alone, when I first started going out there, the average. Um, percentage of rentership was around 39, 40%. And that was like, I don't know how long ago, but in 2019, the last time I was there, it was up to 46%. So the percentage of rentership was going up because the cost of housing was going up. So here, can, can, I mean, can you, can you comment on that? Like the, the, when people are renting, it's like keeping them poor. I mean, it's, it's, um, it may look like an easy short-term solution, but long-term it's definitely damaging. You know, I mean, here they have an option, you know? Oh, absolutely. And and you said something that really gave me goosebumps because I remember, you know, being middle class, you really aren't taught a lot of these elements that are important to the wealthy. And and I wish this was taught in schools, but we don't, like you said, we 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 aren't taught a lot of the things we're taught to think short term. We think money going out is automatically only going one way. So paying rent seems manageable to only go out that way. But when you're paying a mortgage, you have benefits and you have a, you're paying down an asset that gets to come back when you sell it later. And it's a huge mm-hmm. difference, even though it's a, you're making the same payment both ways. One is is drastically better than the other. So right. uh, it's so understanding net worth, understanding how do we pay an asset versus paying rent where rent after at the end of five years, everything that you've paid, you have nothing to show for it. It immediately goes away. Right. Yeah. Whereas if we shift a little bit of that towards ownership, you have an asset that you're buying down and using a loan, just like the well, just like the wealthy people are doing when you're, when you're paying down a loan and a mortgage, you have tax benefits. You, you have the upside of the appreciation potential. And it's, it's basically like a, hidden uh, savings account or a hidden right. piggy bank later down the line becomes an asset that you can sell and be able to have something that you can use to leverage you to purchase single family later down the line. And you have more options later if you have, if you're paying down an asset versus if you keep putting all your money towards rent, right? Do we think that this housing issue is going to get better? I don't think so. I, I see it getting worse and worse with all these problems coming up. And the sooner we analyze, the sooner we realize how money works, the better we can provide for our family, the better we can start our generational wealth to be able to help our families in the future. And I'm frustrated because I, you know, unfortunately we're, we're, we grow up with only the circle that we know. And, and sometimes we can't learn a lot of these huge money tricks and money hacks that we, you know, it's, it's that we should know. And, and it's so important to me to, to spread that knowledge. And that's why we do a lot of this conversation on our YouTube channel of like, what is the difference? What's the five-year difference versus what's the one month period, period difference that most of us only think. Right. right. Yeah. Well, it's interesting too. If you think about, we were talking about the millennials, but what about people who are, you know, according to the United States, uh, statistics by definition are living in poverty you know i mean here's and they're thinking in their mind i mean they're, they're just trying to figure out can they even afford rent should they should there be um uh you know hud section 8 tenant where they're getting rent paid that way but here's an opportunity and i'm sure there's there's got to be some programs available to people to help them get ownership of the mobile homes um because i i think there's i think there's gonna be more of them in our future but but um on your YouTube channel, what, what, what's what's the name of the YouTube channel, Franco? It's Franco Mobile Homes. Franco Mobile Homes. Okay, so everybody go out there and just check it out. Check out some videos, and if you know people, friends, neighbors, relatives that you, you, you they have the ambition, they want to get out of the rut they're in. I mean, there may be some opportunities here for them. But are there are there programs, either um, loan guarantee programs or grants, state state level grants that you're aware of for people to, to buy mobile homes? There are a few. They're not as um, so. Basically, I was at Washington D.C. just 
two weeks ago, really lobbying to get more backing for financing. Mm -hmm. There is going to be more coming in the future now that this is becoming more and more important. However, right now, um, you'll typically see not a lot of government funded, like FHA doesn't work for this, that sort of thing, but there will be soon. And, And the other thing to mention on that is that because it's more attainable, there are loans. They're a little bit different than your regular real estate loans. Instead of 30 years, you'll see 25-year loans. And you'll typically see a 10% down payment that's needed versus like those FHA situations. But the key thing is, is that 10% of a mobile home is way less than what you would pay for 10% of a single family home. That's like four, three or four times the price, right? And understanding that is so important. Um, and then you talked about kind of the opportunity side is like, Keep in mind, like we, we live in America and a big, huge part of the American dream is home ownership. And that gap, the truth is that I hate to say this, but that there is a wealth gap. There, there's, yeah. And that wealth gap is getting worse and worse. And equal and the opportunity for home ownership is also getting split up. It's really not equal. And unfortunately, yeah. it's spreading and spreading. And, and we have to protect that. We have to protect the availability for a middle-class worker, the teachers, the construction workers, to be able to still be able to afford home ownership and get benefits of home ownership. And yeah. this is a huge part of that. We need people that are, we need our country to fight for that too. So, yeah. but uh yeah. Hey, I, I know we're getting close with that, but one more question, and, uh, and I'm sure you get this a lot too. Um, in, in the industry, from what you're knowing and learning and hearing from people, where do you see the future? I mean, it seems to me like we're gonna we're gonna see more and more mobile homes and mobile home parks. I can just feel it in all my clients' you know conversations. But is there any industry wide um, like uh, like long term, long range planning or or a, a strategic planning that you're aware of that's involving mobile homes? There's several different in different areas. You know, there's a lot of noise this year about mobile homes and mobile home parks. It's really been under the radar up until recently. Um, but we're seeing a lot of these bigger entities starting to get involved into it. Okay. I um, I couldn't name one that I'm kind of, uh, uh, I couldn't name one offhand, but, uh, but you know, MHI is a big organization that really pushes for affordable housing like I do. And they help try to create more grants and that sort of thing towards it. But, um, okay. yeah. And, and how about the, the technology with the, and now we're able to 3d print homes. <laughs> this is crazy. Uh-huh. The- and now you got with with AI coming, you know, and Chat GPT. I mean, it's just the, the it seems like the speed of evolution is is increasing ever and ever faster. But any any yeah. any insights you're seeing in mobile home construction techniques, and uh, like we talked about before, coming coming down the road, like are they 3D printing the. I mean, it's I'm sure they're all done in factories yeah. now already. You know. Yeah, I just spoke at the innovative housing thing at, at DC. There was 3D printing printed homes there. There was so many different things, and I'm 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 a big advocate of all innovative housing. Um, you know, one one of the key things with m- mobile homes is that it's something that's already out there. It's not a concept. It's not a prototype. It's already helping families today, and, and that's what I'm excited about. But you'll start to we you'll start to see really the modernization of how these are built. Um, we're using more machines and that sort of thing, but you'll also see like the smart tech uh, that you'll typically see in these these high end homes. You'll you'll have the smart thermostats, you'll have Alexa or Google to be able to turn on and off yeah. the lights, the Ring cameras, that sort of thing. We're starting to implement that a lot more, and really designing the lifestyle as well. The floor plans are really designed to help you know be be more friendly to to these younger generations they want to be able to entertain they want to invite people to their home they want to be able to cook and have a great looking bathroom or kitchen and yeah. and and that's what we're doing that's where we're pushing the limits see the homes that we have and you'll be shocked <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I mean, I've, I've been i i do a good bit of reading and you know, periodicals and things like that and uh this my interest in this has been increasing probably because of the, the the listeners the clientele have been asking more about it and i'm like you can't i mean some of these homes you're looking at are like you can't even tell you can't tell that they're mobile homes but looking at it you know it's amazing so 
Well, listen, man, I really appreciate your time and energy doing this, and I really admire your uh, what you're doing for the community and, and you know helping people see a way to get from where they are to where they want to be, which is you know everybody wants to be financially independent and be a homeowner. That's part of it. Owning a home is a huge part of that financial independence, and you're making it happen. And your passion throws shows through loud and clear, man. I big pat on the back for that, you know. Uh, oh, thanks, man. Really yeah. appreciate that. Yeah, I, I think I'm. Also, I'm uh, Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, I, I, I say I think I'm very passionate about it because I feel like I've felt that pain and I I know what it feels like to be in that position. And and it's kind of weird to say this, but I feel like I, d- I would die just to, you know, I, I will do anything just to help one family be able to get ahead. And I still tear up today when I, when I help one family and I see them so happy because they own something and they finally get to own something. And to do that at scale... It's so fulfilling. And and if yeah. I could say one thing, I think a lot of us are really driven by like with the media, we, we we're very driven by money and finances and how can we make more? But I think I, I really urge entrepreneurs to really try to find a place that where they can actually make impact more. Right. And, and that should be a level of fulfillment. We should also chase fulfillment and the, the, the benefits that we bring to people. I think right. that's something we've always forgotten. Oh, yeah. But, uh, well, it's a cu- couple of famous sayings. One of them is from, from Zig Ziglar, and most people remember who Zig Ziglar is. He, he said, you know, if you just simply help enough other people get what they want, you'll really get plenty of what you want. And the the world will reward you the more people you serve. You know, if, it, if it's for good, it comes from the heart, you're going to be handsomely rewarded. And uh, the great song, um, one of the, the verses, you know, you've got to serve somebody, you know. Um so that, that goes back to the 60s, but it but it's true. And it's a lesson I learned, and most entrepreneurs learn that throughout their entrepreneurial life is, you know what? It actually pays to help somebody improve their life, to serve somebody. Um, it just does. It's natural. It's, it's, it's honorable. It's got integrity. And, you, and you're right, the level of fulfillment, you can't, you can't put a price tag on that, you know? Next time I'm out there, man, I'll definitely look you up, and uh, we'll grab a bite to eat somewhere or head down to the coast. And, either, you know, I don't know if you're a surfer. I, I attempt to surf. I I stink at it, but I love it, you know. <laughs> yeah, cool. And uh I've been trying to do I suck at it. Yeah. <laughs> but it's just nice to be down the water, man. You know, you have no cell phones, no computers, and everybody's happy, you yeah. know. So every now and then you'll see some dolphins or seals or something like that too. But um so hey, uh, real quick, the um how about a you know, website, if you wouldn't mind a YouTube channel, if you could if you could recite that again, a website, anything people can get latch a hold of, you know. Yeah, so all of our links are easily at www.franco.tv. You can see our YouTube channel there. You can see our Matterport uh, links of these homes and how they look. And, um, and or you could Google us at Franco Mobile Homes to see what we're doing. Franco Mobile Homes and, and in Franco TV, that was the first one? www.franco.tv, yeah. Franco.tv, okay, awesome. Well, Franco, thanks again, man. This, this has been awesome. And for everybody listening, thank you for listening. And if you could please leave a review for the podcast, that really helps a lot. That's our, you leaving us a review, that's how we get paid. You know, so we appreciate you doing it. doesn't cost a dime either. So while you're out there, go visit www.franco.tv. Okay. And before you leave the internet, go to globalinvestoration.com. Find yourself an investor agent who's trained to work with you all over the country. Okay. There's, we, very few places where they're not there. You have to be certified. You have to ask for that. Okay. And if you are an agent, you should definitely check it out. Click on the, go to the website and there's a place you can leave your name and email and request a conversation and you're a real life person. And I know it is because it's me. <laughs> and we'll see if, uh, if you're a fit and if this was a fit for you. But everybody take care of yourselves. Uh, God bless you and your families. And we will see you on the next Massive Passive Cashflow Podcast. Thanks for listening to this episode of Massive Passive Cashflow. Be sure to go to realestatewithgarywilson.com to join our community and start building wealth today.